Hi, everyone. Uh, so today I'm just going to go over Fernie's drinking water, and we have just over 100 years to go over, so it might be a little fast, but we'll start here. So I'm basically going to go historical to now, talking about our water sources, quality and quantity, then touch on current issues and things we're looking for in the future. And as you may know, the city of Fernie draws from two distinct sources, Ferry Creek and the James White Wells. And Ferry Creek is what we started off with at the early 20th century. This is a picture of the watershed of Ferry Creek. It's all the area that drains or sheds water into the Ferry Creek or into an aquifer underground. It's just over 27 kilometers in square and it's bordered by the high mountain peaks of Mount Fernie, the Three Sisters, and Mount Proctor. Ferry Creek itself, we believe, begins underground just at the base of the Three Sisters, and obviously it ends in the Elk River. The city of Fernie holds the only two water licenses on Ferry Creek, and that's the ability to take and use water. The first one we got in 1904, the second in 1955. And in total, that gives us about 355 liters a second we may use from the river. However, in recent years, we, haven't, we don't even uh, demand that much. Our peak day demand is somewhere around 145 liters per second, so less than half. One big problem about Ferry Creek is that it can drastically change in flow. In spring and freshet, it's really high flowing, but by the end of the summer and into winter, much lower flows. So in effort to curb that change, in the early 19th century, a uh, fieldstone dam was built above the first Ferry Creek Falls, and that allowed for an impoundment of water behind it, and that water was piped to town. And that was it for about 80 years. There's no treatment of any kind. And so anytime there is like a rainstorm or whenever snow melt happened, you get all the rocks and the sticks and the leaves from Ferry Creek all the way into the pipes of town. Not the best. So in the early 80s, with that first field stone down beginning to deteriorate, a new dam was built in 1983. And this became the second Ferry Creek impoundment. This one did include a screening chamber, so those bigger rocks and sticks were filtered out before it got into the town water supply, but that was about it for treatment at that time. This dam is still there. It's still a, a provincially recognized active dam, but as of now, the impoundment ability behind it is kind of gone. All the rocks and stuff have come down Ferry Creek and filled up behind that dam. And in the 80s, now that the quantity of water for town was uh, kind of met, the quality of water became the bigger issue. And it was actually just not a new issue, it's, it actually came back to the watershed. So if we look at that watershed picture again, where those impoundments are is at the dam and reservoir part, but if you travel about one and a half kilometers upstream, you would actually see in the 80s two springs rise out of the ground. And during the dry months, that's actually where most of the flow from Ferry Creek comes from. Upstream of that, the creek beds in the valleys can be very dry. And animals use these creek beds as pathways throughout the year as they are an accessible pathway. But then whenever a rainstorm occurs or snow melt, anything that the animals may have dropped <laughs> comes into our creek and then into the water supply. So this causes dirty water, turbid water, and hiding within those organic particles can be things like cryptosporidium or uh, giardia, the beaver fever. So the city would uh, call out um, water quality boil water advisories to protect the community from these waterborne parasites. And in the late 80s, a study was done for how we could help with the water quality. And at that point, for counselors, it was political suicide to suggest chlorination. So uh, in 1990, what they decided to do was try and capture this spring water underground before it would meet the above ground, often turbid stream flows from upstream. And this is what was built. It's an intake structure that captures the springs. And then above it is this um, channel and so what you can see here is there's a 
fall rain event and there's a lot of water coming from upstream and going over the channel, but this is last July and you can see there's no water coming from Ferry Creek upstream. Everything that we would see from Ferry Creek is actually coming from those two underground creeks. And so those um, springs themselves are part of an aquifer in the Ferry Creek watershed. That's where that water is coming from. Unfortunately, this wasn't enough, even though like it was lauded as like the big thing and it's gonna fix it all. And even there is a bottle of water outside that was uh, bottled as part of the opening ceremonies for this intake structure. Um, it wasn't enough. Their boil water advisories still were happening. So in 1993 for chemical treatment, chlorine gas was chosen before the water goes into the water supply. A quick stop here to talk about water storage. We've already talked about the impoundments one and two, but in 1923 on the other side of the valley, Ridgemont got a reservoir, an open um, air reservoir, about 2.4 million liters. And it was there to help with water balance or if you needed more water for emergencies such as fires. Um, in later years, it was isolated from the system, only uh, could be used as needed. And it was decommissioned in 2010. And 2010 was a busy year, as you can see, because also what came online was our current Northwest Reservoir, which is back up near Ferry Creek. So this is the construction of that reservoir. It holds about 5 million liters of water in two cells. It improved uh, disinfection contact time because the water sits with the chlorine for a while and improved the fire flows for the entire city. And back to sources a little in the history back in the 80s, the city was looking since the 80s for a secondary source because Ferry Creek in spring does get turbid and there's those boiled water advisories. They thought, why not a secondary source? This was kind of, we could switch to that during those times. It could also help whenever we have low creek flows and we want more water. So a first foray into looking for potential sites happened in about 1986 and they found a, a good potential one in Mount View Park, which is now called James White Park. And our current wells were built, started construction in 2016, and started to contribute to the system in 2018. And they are still just our secondary source. We only use them when Ferry Creek is turbid or we need to supplement the water supply. And I'll talk about them more in our current issues. So that's a very basic overview of the system we have now. We have two sources, one big reservoir, and about 81 kilometers of pipe in between, ranging in age, material, and size from cast iron and copper to PVC. There's two major issues uh, facing the utility these days. The first one is uh, an alternative groundwater source. So as you may know, uh, selenium is in the Elk River and seasonally uh, the Quality, the quantity of selenium is above the BC drinking water guidelines. And this, the Elk River influences our aquifer, so we see the selenium in our aquifer as well. And so we test the raw water of the wells weekly to track that concentration. And we only use the wells whenever everything's within the BC water quality guidelines. But that means we can't rely on our wells right now. So we we're working with tech to find an alternative aquifer to use as a new secondary source. Secondly, water usage. Back in 2015, the city did a deep dive into community water usage. And what we found was that 50% of the water that we took from Ferry Creek or the wells too, wasn't even making it to the taps. It was lost to leaks, 50%. So um, unlike this picture, a lot of the time the leaks are not like just out of the ground. It's like, oh, there's a break right there. No, because a lot of Fernie is on river gravels. Leaks will just go away underground soundlessly, never coming to surface, never becoming apparent. And while the city is responsible for the repair and maintenance of the water distribution system in the public realm, there is no such requirements for private properties. That kind of brings me to what we're looking for in the future. I've talked about the alternative groundwater source, but we're also looking in treatment upgrades for Ferry Creek. We're looking into uh, adding filtration there so that when there is turbidity, we can filter it out when we cannot rely on our secondary source at this time. Third, we're bringing back proactive leak detection on the capital project list this year. And finally, two very important bylaws are gonna be introduced and hopefully adopted this year. 
And the interesting parts of those bylaws will allow the city to action repairs on private properties and will be able to uh, potentially limit outdoor watering usage. So those are coming out uh, to be discussed this year. And that's it for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good.